Hello folks and welcome to Aurora Play. My name is Jesse Marion Davis and I am joined today by Henry Baldwin, Principal Percussion at Aurora Orchestra. Henry, tell me what you love about playing with Aurora Orchestra. I've been in Aurora from the start. I'm one of the, uh, I guess I call myself a founding member, you know, so I was just around at that time and it, it actually grew out of a group of friends in the National Youth Orchestra and then people went off to university or, or music college and some bright people thought let's set up a, an orchestra and manage to get some funding so it had a very kind of ad hoc youth orchestra feel at the beginning i don't mean in terms of the quality of music making although having said that the nyo are amazing so i, I just mean it's it had that sheen of professionalism on the playing side but it was a it was a group of friends getting together and playing really and um that's never really left the orchestra so there are a lot of advantages one it, when I play with them, I still, it still, I still have that kind of enthusiasm that you have, you know, the, the excitement on a youth orchestra course when you heard a piece for the first time, and you know, it's just you just blown away by it. That that kind of feeling I still get when I play with Aurora. It's not the kind of mercenary, you know, go into a recording studio, do something, get as much money as you can, move on, which obviously we have to do to earn money. So that's it's amazing. I love that. And then on top of that, uh, because we have a kind of strange relationship with the management and uh, Nick, uh, the music director, because we started off playing alongside Nick in the orchestra. Um, he can ask us slash tell us to do things that he probably wouldn't dare with other orchestras. And generally, rather than calling the MU and saying, right, you know, we need representation, you know, that's cruelty to musicians or something. We all just go, oh, okay, yeah, fine, we'll give it a go. So we. We have the opportunity to try things out like Berlioz with masks twirling around and holding glitter balls and what, what have you, you know. We get to try things out that they, they wouldn't be able to try anywhere else in the world, I think. And uh, I find it really exciting to be part of that. And also, the other thing is that if I think about my musical highlights, I mean, I've been very lucky. I've got, I had two jobs in symphony orchestras in the UK as well, and I love going to work day to day and playing the classic repertoire in a normal setting. But if I think about my absolute musical highlights of my life and the kind of the most dramatic musical uh, experiences I've had and the kind of most embarrassing and the most, you know, all of the, all of the extremes, a good proportion of those concerts were with Aurora. So it's, you know, it's, it's amazing. I love it. <laughs> Today we are exploring Brett Dean's Pastoral Symphony, which was performed by the orchestra at the BBC Proms in 2015. And if you'd like to watch this full performance, you can follow along. At the end of the video, there is a link to the complete performance. Um, I guess, could you start by telling us a bit about this piece? Yeah, sure. Um, well, firstly, I love Brett Dean's music. It's absolutely amazing. I've been very lucky to play quite a few of his big works. And uh, this piece, um, it really, uh, well, he's a nature lover, uh, and this piece is all about nature, a little bit like the Beethoven, that's the theme, but he's really focusing on human interaction with nature, and, you know, the band is quite a dark piece, it's about how we're destroying nature. So there are lots of um, sampled sounds that he uses, uh, some bird song, some machinery and urban sounds as well, and he blends those with a normal kind of chamber orchestra, it's quite um, a big role for the percussion, which is, I guess, why you're talking to me. And uh, what we do is we really, um, we're very good at kind of linking those two sound worlds and blending them together. So a lot of the sounds that the percussion make almost sound like an electronic sample and they, and they blend the two things together. It's a really amazing effect, actually. So you performed this piece, The Pastoral Symphony by Brett Dean, alongside Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, a big, meaty programme. Um, Brett Dean, I mean, obviously it's a different take on nature. I mean, we've got the idyllic depiction of nature in, in Beethoven's work, but there's a darker, um, would you say there's a message, I suppose, to this, to this piece? The bird song, obviously I, now I've actually listened to the piece um, rather than just played it. I, I, I 
get I get the kind of oral landscape he's trying to produce, and that bird song dies out at certain points. And there's there's one moment in the music where there's this um, this uh, electronic sample of a of a industrial wood chopper just going. Choo, choo. It's because it's, it's been a slow, eerie beginning, and and this this kind of leads us into this really frenetic section, and it's really menacing actually. And at the end of the, uh, towards the end of the uh, piece, uh, percussion actually has a big role to play because we we I have to play this improvised thing on a snare drum, which is like a kind of drum and bass groove or something. And it's it, that is the sound. That's the kind of the sound of an urban landscape of a city. And at that point, the brass players are doing these long held notes with. Uh, crescendos and decrescendos, creating this kind of Doppler effect. The idea being like a cars going past you, horns and that thing, that kind of thing. So we've gone from this these kind of wild sounds in nature, all the way through to basically no sounds. So at the end of this piece, that there, there are no bird, there is no bird song. So obviously the message is we, we're on this path, and and this is this is where we'll end up if we keep on. <laughs> 2015 that message was a really strong message but with everything that's been going on especially in Australia earlier in the year you know it's now more than ever it's just such an important message I think so yeah that's the message but I'm quite glad that we did the Beethoven seconds over it was kind of a happy ending to the to the concert. Henry you mentioned that this is in places terrifying to perform as a percussionist um can you tell us a bit a bit more about the the challenges that you you face in this piece? Being a percussionist, we have we often have very different experiences from the rest of the orchestra. So there's something that everybody else might be finding terrifyingly difficult, we find fairly easy because we our role is pretty minimal. And then other things that people, you know, every other member of Aurora that was playing this piece had a, a piece of music in front of them and an instrument they had to play it. And although the part was very difficult, th there's no kind of logistical challenge there. For me, I mean, it's a nightmare because you get, with any contemporary pieces like this, you get a list of instruments and the first thing I have to do is spend hours trying to work out what setup will mean that I can jump from instrument to instrument and I'll have a, a few goes before I can get something to that, that works. And the added layer of difficulty is that I don't own all of these instruments, so I'm doing all this in my mind. It's not the first time I play all of the instruments set up together is the first rehearsal. So I'll get maybe 20 minutes on the setup once I've got in before the first rehearsal and set everything up. I'll get 20 minutes on that setup to try out what I've been thinking about for perhaps months sometimes. So that logistical thing, there are, there are a number of challenges. One is the kind of space between the instruments. Do you have a bar to get to another instrument? Do you, is, do you have time? Can you reach something? over another instrument if you just have to play one note, all of those kind of things. But another thing is the um, sticks that I have to use. And now, Brett Dean is very specific about the, the quality of sound he wants on instruments. And uh, I'll just give you a quick example. This here is a, is a snare drum, which features, in, which features in the piece quite a lot. And uh, if you just bear with me, uh, this is a normal pair of snare drum sticks that we'd use just to play um, any kind of to play normal percussive sounds that's your standard set of sticks but Brett also likes to use brushes uh, so you can get these kind of effects uh, but sometimes he wants a piece uh, the part to go instantly from sticks to brushes so I had to buy a pair of stick brushes which have one end like a stick and another end like a pair of brushes. And then I found that when I got these, I couldn't do a proper roll with these sticks because of the weighting. So I then bought another pair which have plastic, shorter plastic brushes, which is a compromise. And then also sometimes he likes to have metal sounds on a cymbal directly after the snare drum. So I had to buy a pair which have metal tips. So they still work normally, but then when I go over to the cymbal, they'll have a different sound. And also, he likes a softer sound on the tom-toms on occasion, so I have these ones, which are normal sticks, and then when I have to immediately flip 
over and I can play with this kind of hard felt, which has this kind of a, you probably can't tell the difference on Zoom, but it's kind of a softer sound. And lastly, I have these things, which are called hot rods, which um, I also had to use at one point to go between brushes and sticks, but the brush sound wasn't the right sound. So I ended up having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pairs of sticks just to play one instrument. And half of the um, complication with the setup is actually working out where these sticks need to be. And then also I'll have multiple um, part sets of music dotted around and making sure that when I arrive somewhere with no time to spare, that it's already on the correct page. So I have the kind of challenge of playing the music, but I also have the challenge of having this kind of very rigid, uh, very rigid uh, setup all the way through about when I have to turn pages and I often have written in my music. Sometimes I'll be playing something on marimba and it will just say turn tubular bell page and I have to run over and turn that page and run back and carry on with marimba. I don't, I'm not playing that, but that's for in five minutes when I have to go over with no time to spare, it will be on the right page. So the terrifying thing is when you run over to an instrument and you go, oh, I didn't turn the page 10 minutes ago. I don't know what happens next. So that's the kind of, that's where the anxiety dreams kick in, you know. I mean, I suppose with Aurora, I know that you, you've done as an orchestra a, a lot of, of memorising and playing entire yeah. symphonies from heart, by heart, uh, including the pastoral by Beethoven, which obviously was part of this concert. <laughs> This discipline, this way of playing that percussionists already have, which is that you're often moving between stands. Are, are you better placed as instrumentalists to be carrying an entire symphony in your head? And obviously I'm not talking about Brett Dean here, I'm talking about the, the Beethoven symphony, yeah. but do, do you think that makes it easier or harder? You have s sort of so much more potentially all these little uh, notes written on your part. I think that uh, my experience, especially with the pastoral symphony, my experience is very different from everybody else's. The, the timpani part for the pastoral symphony is, is kind of four lines and it's just a few notes in the storm and then it's over. So it took me 15 minutes to memorise the day before. I kind of knew it anyway. So I think my experience of that concert was terrified for the first half and then chill out and really enjoy Beethoven VI in the second half. I think most of the other, uh, the rest of the orchestra were kind of the other way around, right? They were thinking, get through this Brett Dean, which is hard, but I've got the music, oh, isn't that a luxury? And then terrified about doing Beethoven VI on stage. Uh, I think that um, it's difficult to say if, I, I don't know if that's helped having that kind of thing about having to, I, I think maybe when it comes to the, the comfort blanket of having a part in front of you, maybe that's something that we're better at dealing with, because I know a lot of people have said the first time they did a memorised project, it wasn't so much the ability to learn the music, it was that kind of feeling of self-consciousness that, that, you know, you're just so used to be able to look at this thing. I mean, I had it as well the first time I did it, I was kind of like, well, I'm just kind of staring at Nick and does he think I'm being weird? Is that because I don't know where else to look? Because I'm so used to just, when I need to, looking at the stand. So, but I, maybe, maybe that was less of an adjustment for me. What's your process? I mean, I've asked Torren and Jane and Amy in previous interviews and everybody, it seems, has their own personal way to commit the music to the brain. Uh, what works for you, Henry? The interesting thing about my part in the kind of classical uh, repertoire, so Mozart, Beethoven, is that basically the timpani, it, well, it's not until Beethoven 7 that anything other than the tonic and dominant of the home key of the symphony is used. So if I'm doing something in C major and the overall key of the, the symphony is C major, I have a C and a G. And then when it works, modulates and works through different chords, maybe it goes to a relative minor or whatever, I still only have those two notes and they'll be picking out different parts of chords and everything. So whereas somebody who has a melody and, and can really feel and think that melody and it's, it kind of goes in quite quickly, what I'm learning is basically binary code. It's like an endless string. It's like ones and zeros, one, zero, zero, one, zero. Three of those, two of those, four of those, extra bar, rest. So it's kind of weirdly unmusical in a way. But I go through the process and what I love is that eventually I just know it and I just know when to come in. And then there's this kind of real release of you're just there enjoying the music. There'll always be the odd moments where 
you have to suddenly go, right, I've got to remember it was 37 miles rest this time instead of 36 like every time, other time or something. But generally, like those moments are few and far between by the time we get to the perform performances. And um, that's an amazingly liberating experience to play the tints uh, in that way, knowing the music so well as well. Because the thing about this memory thing is forgetting about the visual impact of not having the stands, we just get more rehearsal time because we have to go through this process. And this repertoire that we normally kind of bang out on a three hour rehearsal, we suddenly we're like really concentrating on all the detail in a way that you never do when you've got the music. And, you know, in the UK, there isn't a lot of money for orchestras. So we're always time poor with rehearsal. They're always doing the bare minimum because that's all we can afford. So it's a real luxury to have that time and get to that point where you can really like focus on different people and who you're linking up with and in, enjoy that process rather than just vaguely know it's going on. That's amazing. My follow up question was going to be, is it worth the effort then? And it sounds like... Yeah, yes. yeah, um, it is. And um, what I think is great is that I know we're supposed to be talking about Brett Dean and Beethoven, but the last project that we did, the, the Berlioz, um, was really exciting because I think in terms of the music and learning the music and the extra rehearsal time, I think we're, we're kind of maxing out the advantage that we have there. But in terms of the, the ability to do things that orchestras can't do when you've got the furniture on stage that a, a normal symphony orchestra has, and you have the ability, you don't have to look at music. I think we're only at the beginning of the journey of kind of realising the potential of, of that thing. And, you know, I, I know that very early on, there were a lot of crits who were saying, yeah, that was a great performance of X symphony, but we felt that the orchestra looked a little bit inhibited, inhibited. And then later on, they looked less inhibited. And now we're starting to dance and put masks on and do crazy things. And I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not allowed to talk about future projects, but it being Nick and Jane and, and John, they're obviously, they haven't gone, okay, that was ridiculous. Let's just stop there and just keep doing stuff like that. They're, they're gonna go bigger and better and more terrifying and more exciting, I think, in, in the coming years. So, so watch this space, I would say. That's wonderful. And of course, you're talking about Nick Holland, conductor, Jane Mitchell, creative director, John Hart, yeah. chief exec of the orchestra, an incredible creative force. So yeah, you've heard it here, everybody. Watch this space for the future. And if you want to watch the performance of Brett Dean's Pastoral Symphony, you can do that. Follow the link at the end of this video. And it just remains for me to say thank you so much Henry, for being here today and talking and sharing your experiences of this performance. Thank you so much. I've loved it.